It's going through a good location, you know, in our minds. This chocolate course for gas didn't start yesterday. It's been in the years in progress. Tonight, not all hereditary chiefs are against pipeline projects in their unceded territory. When there's a Pandora's box, if you will, that violates and waters down our treaty rights. Manitoba is trying to push its jurisdiction with a fee on the First Nation cannabis industry. They have decided to willfully violate their constitutional duties and obligations. And we look back on what's happened on the political scene in Ottawa in 2018. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. A BC judge has granted an interim injunction to remove a gate that blocks access to pipeline workers. The company building the coastal gas link pipeline wanted to post an injunction notice on the gates of the Unistone camp, but a new checkpoint 20 kilometers down the road set up by the Gitdumten clan prevented coastal gas link from doing so. Instead, the company posted the interim injunction at the new Get Dumb 10 checkpoint. Right now, there is no police presence on the ground at either camp, but there are police helicopters flying overhead. And people say they're, and people there say they are ready. I believe what they're doing is they're just assessing uh, what's going on. I don't see it uh, as them trying to provoke anything, uh, maybe to put a little fear into us, but um, they're assessing. Uh, what what their next move is going to be is what I believe they're doing. The coastal gas link pipeline will run nearly 700 kilometers from northern British Columbia to the Pacific coast. About a third of it will run through Wet'suwet'en territory and there are now two protest camps in place there to try to stop construction. The protest camps have support of many hereditary chiefs but not all of them. APTN's Lori Hamlin met with one hereditary chief who says the pipeline will be good for her community and has her full support. Helen Michelle has been a hereditary chief for 43 years and she takes her role very seriously. When the Coastal Gaslink Pipeline project was proposed in 2012, she made sure to participate in consultation. Our elders told us, you know, when you have opportunity with good business, we're not prejudiced. If there's opportunities there, work with them. And this is the first opportunity we've ever had to work with a company with Coastal Gas, and they work directly with us. The Coastal Gaslink Pipeline project will run 670 kilometers from Dawson Creek, BC, to a processing plant in Kitimat on the coast. There, the gas will be liquefied and shipped to Asian markets. 190 kilometers of the pipeline will run through Wet'suwet'en's traditional lands. Michelle grew up fishing and picking berries in that area and says she isn't worried about damage to her territory. Damaging our traditional territory, I don't believe in that. There are now two protest camps set up within Wet'suwet'en territory. In that territory, there are six different First Nations within. Michelle is from the Skintai Nation and she says the pipeline will benefit her people. We as a small band are really struggling and we want better education and economic development for our young generation. Michelle says negotiations with Coastal Gas Link have been going on with elders and elected council for years and the deal they signed with the company is good. Basically it's going through a good location you know in our minds this chocolate course for gas didn't start yesterday. It's been in the years in progress. We supported it. We walked the line where coastal gas was going to go. We were on the ground. The pipeline has the backing of elected leadership, but some Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs don't want the project and say the ban council doesn't have the jurisdiction to give consent. Michelle doesn't agree. She says hereditary chiefs and elected chiefs must work together. Myself and my hereditary chiefs and my elders and our community, we worked with our young chief. We have the youngest chief in the country and we worked with him to make this happen. If the pipeline doesn't go through, 
millions of dollars and many jobs would be lost for Wet'suwet'en Nation. Michelle says the hereditary chiefs in opposition need to step aside for the good of future generations. I'm just getting tired of hearing about it. I'm just waiting for the shovel to get into the ground. Let's get on with our lives. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Wet'suwet'en Territory. Even with all the action Canada is taking on climate, we're still behind in hitting existing promises to cut emissions. Environment Minister Catherine McKenna says Canada will increase its goals by 2020. Working together, we can fight climate change. We can do this. This is about the world we want. Canada has a huge opportunity to be a leader in the world. Climate Change Canada officials believe faster adoption of things like electric cars and better public transit will get Canada all the way to that goal by the year 2030, a deadline set in the recent Paris Climate Agreement. And we'd like to hear what you have to say. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us uh, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for the latest Indigenous headlines. The Kanjikum First Nation in Northern Ontario no longer has to rely on diesel fuel for power. APTN's Willow Fiddler is in Pekanjikum and has the details. You won't find any Christmas lights on houses here in Pekanjikum. That's because the community of about 3,000 people doesn't have the power to light them. But that all changes today when this Christmas tree behind me will light up and Pekanjikum becomes the first community to get connected to the province's power grid, ending their reliance on diesel fuel. Pekanjikum is one of 22 First Nations that own Watena Kniat Power, a new transmission company that will connect 16 more communities in Northern Ontario by 2023. The Chief Executive Officer of Wate Power says today's celebration is a game changer and a remarkable achievement for First Nations in control of their own infrastructure. Being on the power grid also means the community will be able to build more houses. Chief Dean Owen explains what it means for his community. This has created a lot of, a lot of troubles, a lot of heartache for families that have to really share homes with maybe 10, 15, some 20 persons in a two, two or three bedroom home. We're very, very proud to, to actually be, uh, be the first of the 17. And, uh, and, all, and all, all I'll say is what our elders have said. If we can have this, the rest of our neighbors, First Nations, need to stoop. To Manitoba now, and beginning in 2019, on-reserve cannabis retailers will be expected to pay a fee to the provincial government. Premier Brian Pallister confirmed the fee would extend to First Nations during a year-end interview. Manitoba originally proposed the so-called social responsibility fee before the legalization of recreational cannabis in October, though it wasn't clear whether First Nations would be subject to the same tax. The tax will equal 6% of the retailer's total annual revenue. Of the dozen or so retailers who have opened in the province, there are four on reserve or on urban reserve land. Many First Nations leaders are challenging the tax, saying cannabis should be treated like tobacco. Opasquiac Cree Nation Chief Christian Sinclair said he, along with others, may pursue legal action. It sets a dangerous precedent in other areas. What's to stop the provincial government imposing a social responsibility fee on other commodities or other services? So it opens a Pandora's box, if you will, that violates and waters down our treaty rights. And this is something we have to sit down and seriously pursue. Uh, we're open to negotiation with the provincial government of Manitoba and seeing how we can resolve this. So it's a win-win situation as opposed to coming from the top down and being imposed on us. Time to step aside for a quick break, but before we do, here's a look at what's coming up after tonight's newscast. Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. I have a wide-ranging interview with the federal leader of the NDP. Jagmik Singh talks about Indigenous sovereignty, the murdered and missing women and girls inquiry, 
and child welfare reform, just to name a few things. As well, Liberal MP for Winnipeg Centre, Robert Falconoulette, is in our Ottawa studio. He tells us about how the meth crisis is out of control in his riding, and what he wants Ottawa and the province of Manitoba to do about it. That's coming up right after the national news. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Seven with showers for Halifax, five in rain in Charlottetown, minus seven with snow in Nain, minus six for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Cartwright, plus six with showers for Montreal, rain and zero for Quebec City. Showers in Toronto with a high of five, showers and plus four for Ottawa, minus seven in Thunder Bay, minus eight in Wawa and Capus Casing. In northern Manitoba, minus 23 in Churchill, 10 below with snow in Norway House. Minus 6 with snow for Winnipeg, minus 2 in a rain-snow mix for Brandon and Dauphin. Minus 3 with rain in Regina, 0 and snow in North Battleford. Minus 2 in Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. In 2018, Parliament Hill was a flurry of legislative activity that will affect Indigenous peoples. Perhaps the biggest announcement happened last Valentine's Day when Prime Minister Trudeau made a speech about renewing the relationship through a rights framework initiative. But as Todd Lamoran reports, that promise may not be kept. An implementation. The Prime Minister's Valentine's rights. Day speech was about recognizing and implementing rights where Indigenous peoples in Canada are in control of their own destiny, making their own decisions about their future. Trudeau promised to have legislation tabled and passed by the next election in October 2019. And so, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett conducted engagement meetings throughout the summer but by the end of it, groups like the Chiefs of Ontario criticized the process and wanted it restarted. There is no recognition of, uh, of uh, our inherent rights. There is no recognition of, uh, of our international treaties. There's no recognition of how we're going to deal with land matters. There's no recognition of how we're going to deal with the provinces. At the time, AFN National Chief Perry Bellegarde no longer believed the initiative could be done by the next election. And you can't get it done in two months. That can't be done in two months. So the message that I'm hearing from First Nations is slow it down and do it right. And at the recent AFN Chiefs Assembly, the Prime Minister conceded there would be delays, but still touted the framework as a way forward for this new partnership. And that's why the rights and recognition framework that we are working on is so very, very important. And we heard from you that we need to do some more work on that together, and we will. Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott has often characterized child welfare in this manner. I have described the Indigenous child welfare system in this country as a humanitarian crisis. So back in January, she participated in an emergency meeting on child and family services with Indigenous stakeholders. During a scrum, she talked about the need for Indigenous control over CFS. We know that uh, many communities want to control the child welfare system for their own families and communities, and we're absolutely supportive of that. After nearly a year of consultations, Philpott announced legislation had been co-developed. The decisions about the future of children and the well-being of children should be based on the best interests of those children. A few days later at the AFN Chiefs Assembly, Trudeau announced the legislation would be tabled in January will affirm inherent and treaty rights to exercise jurisdiction over children and families. As a result, we'll put kids first, have fewer children in care, and reunite more families. He also announced an Indigenous Languages Act is on the way, something National Chief Bellegarde has long lobbied for. A new relationship means working together on legislation to preserve and protect Indigenous languages, which we'll introduce in Parliament this January. Which is fitting, because after all, 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Now, you can applaud for that one, Perry. <laughs> Capital. 
NDP MP Romeo Staganash's private member's bill is a good chance of passing into law. Bill C-262 would make sure the laws of Canada are in harmony with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It passed second reading in the Senate and will go to committee there next February. But Saganash is best known this past year for asking this question about the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. That Canada will not be able to accommodate all Indigenous concerns. What that means is that they have decided to willfully violate their constitutional duties and obligations. Mr. Minister, Mr. Speaker, sounds like a most important relationship, doesn't it? Why doesn't the Prime Minister just say the truth and tell the Indigenous peoples that he doesn't give a f about their rights? In the new year, we'll be coming to you from a different location as center block behind me goes through a decade-long renovation. The House will sit in West Block, while the Senate will move over to the former conference center. Todd Lamarand, APTN National News, Ottawa. There's a court case in Winnipeg pitting one community against the other. It revolves around the Keystone Hockey League, a junior B league that used to be comprised of teams from southern and northern Manitoba. The teams from the south decided to leave Keystone and form a league of their own. CTV Winnipeg's John Hendricks has more. Five Manitoba First Nations have taken a hockey fight from the ice to a Winnipeg courtroom. They're suing the Central Region Junior Hockey League, a new league that began this year in southern Manitoba. It's blatant racism, I believe, in terms of segregating our First Nation teams and non-First Nation teams. In his submission to the court, Jamie Kagan, the lawyer representing the First Nation, said this isn't about travel. It's about a group of people who don't want First Nations on their teams and league. Last year, the KJHL featured teams from northern First Nation communities and there were teams from the south, including communities such as Winnipeg. The lawsuit alleges that in May of 2018, the southern teams broke away from the KJHL without giving the proper notice and formed the rival league. Days before the hockey league was to begin, that's when we were notified. The First Nations are asking Justice Herbert Rempel for an injunction preventing the rival league from operating with the sanctioning of Hockey Manitoba. Further, they want any player who is in the KJHL during the 2017-2018 season to be forced to either get a release or not play in a league sanctioned by Hockey Manitoba. But Justice Herbert Rempel asked Kagan if this injunction wasn't like forcing a singer to sing. Jamie Kagan told the court, we are not asking you to force the kids to come back. They just give up their career in hockey. They aren't entitled to play in another league. The lawyer defending the upstart league didn't agree. Bill Bowles told the court the defendants were entitled to leave. What they have to show is there were damages from the lack of notice given. There is no evidence of any damage due to the lack of proper notice. Bowles said this lawsuit is, quote, entirely without merit because the appeals the plaintiffs have available through Hockey Manitoba have not been exhausted. And that point was echoed by Bob Sikulski, the lawyer representing Hockey Manitoba. He said the Hockey League's constitution prohibits the First Nations from going to court before exhausting all rights of appeal. And Peguis wants to join the rival league or for the two leagues to reunite, neither of which is within the power of Hockey Manitoba, so instead they did a power play and came to court. John Hendricks, CTV News, Winnipeg. Time for another quick break, but stick around, there's more to come. Here's the rest of Friday's weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta. Minus 5 for Grand Prairie and Peace River. Plus 3 with snow for Medicine Hat. Plus 4 in Lethbridge. 8 above for Tofino in Victoria with rain. Plus four in Kamloops, minus 16 under the sun for Dees Lake, sunny and minus six in Smithers, minus 24 for Old Crow, 23 below for Watson Lake, minus 18 in Fort Liard and Trout Lake, 20 below for Fort Simpson, snow and 18 below for Saks Harbor, minus 20 in Anubik. 
27 below for Repulse Bay, minus 29 in Chesterfield and Whale Cove, minus 29 as well for Arctic Bay, 28 below in Agulik. Welcome back. Uh, Manitoba School has unveiled a touching tribute to honor and remember Tina Fontaine. Growing up, Fontaine attended Powerview School. The school has honored the teen with a mural depicting the 15-year-old on one of the school's hallways. Fontaine was murdered. Her body was found in the Red River in August of 2014. The mural was painted by Indigenous artist Shauna Grappentine as a way to honor Tina and all missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Before we unveiled it, there was some uh, uh, initial reluctance because, you know, it's a pretty deep topic to have in a K-12 school. Uh, but since the unveiling, I think uh, it's been taken in uh, very well. Uh, you know, the younger kids don't really know why it's there. You know, they just think it's a young, beautiful Indigenous woman. As kids get older, then, you know, they get taught about uh, Red Ribbon Day and why it's in our building. Fontaine's murder remains unsolved. In February of 2018, a jury acquitted Raymond Cormier of second-degree murder in the death of the 15-year-old. Before we leave you tonight, we go to sunny Australia, where the Uluru Statement from the Heart has played an important role at the Winds of Zenadath Festival. One of our young friends with National Indigenous Television has this story for us tonight. Hi, my name's Leah. I'm in year four and I'm 10 years old. What's your name? Uh, my name's Thomas and I'm from Darwin. What are you working as? Well, I've been advocating for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and taking it around the country to try and get people to support it. That's good. Um, who drew? Uh, so the drawing is by Anangu woman, Renny Kulitcha. Um, she comes from Murutzulu and she painted it at Uluru in the red sand there. Um, who wrote all that? Uh, so all those people, all those names that you see around the, the words in the middle, those are all the people that basically wrote it. They came up with this special idea and then together they voted that, um, that that's what we want to say to Australia. Were there lots of people there? Yeah, there's around 250 names there and they're from many, many different First Nations. They're all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. How can we get involved? Ah, well, you can tell your friends about it. You can tell your parents about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Let them know that you saw this very special um, sacred document. And um, you can do things on social media. Uh, tell the government that um, you think that this should be actioned and um, that the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need to be realised now. What's your favourite primary school in the Torres Strait? Well, it's this one. Because <laughs> Sacred Heart is an awesome school because obviously they've taught you very well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alia reporting for NITV on Thursday Island. That was a hard hitting question there at the end. Uh, future journalists in the making. That's your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and download the APTN News app to stay up to date. Stick around Nation to Nation with Todd Lamarand is next. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.